ahead and begin recording. And um, then I will also begin our presentation. So welcome everyone today on Wednesday the 13th of September to our session today, Practicing Partnership with the Earth. This is the first of five sessions that will be going deeply into some very new and interesting kind of exploratory applications of partnership. And as Rian Eisler is quoted here, we certainly are partners in our own evolution. That's a part of the worldview that we're, we're moving towards now. It's very exciting. So welcome, welcome. And what I'd like to do to um, ground us a bit, uh, there may be a few people coming on, and I think someone just joined us. Hello? Donna, could you take a look at the um, attendee list real quick and let me know if there's a new... Anne? Oh, hello. Hey, it's JT. How are you? Oh, JT, I'm so glad you're here with us. I'm great. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Yeah, great to hear your voice. I'm, I'm asking Donna to help us, uh, to help me look at the uh, uh, control panel as my computer just shows me my presentation. So I didn't know who it was that had come on, but I'm glad you're here. And awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's just really a treat to have this lovely group. We may have a few more people logging on. Our group should be about 12 or 13 today, uh, minus a few who are unavailable today, but probably will be with us next week. So what I'd like um, us to do um, in our little online cyber world here is just take maybe a minute or two to center ourselves and drop into our breathing, into our bodies. Wherever you are, if you're, if you're sitting down, you might even want to Stand up like I'm doing right now and get a little bit of a stretch. Get a sense of how your feet are landing on the ground beneath you. Get a really good feeling for how your breath is moving into the center of your being. And how your breath is breathing in light and energy from the earth itself, from all other beings, from trees, from sky. As you're breathing deeply, you are taking in that beauty. You're also metabolizing it as you, as a person that's connected to everything and is receiving the energy of the world. As you breathe out, you're offering that blessing of your presence to the world itself. So the deep breathing in and out, the feeling of the bottom of our feet on the surface of the floor, which in fact is the earth, that sensing in our muscles, in our body, in our skin, that we truly are connected with that earth below us. And we truly are made of that stardust that is the ancient cosmos that is the sun, that is the earth itself, in all these different diverse forms as it's come forth over 14 billion years of the unfolding story of the universe. This is who you are. This is who we are. And even though we're not physically in the same room, our breath and the feeling in our feet and our presence together today puts us in the same energetic space. That's quite tangible, actually. So breathing in, releasing that breath, getting really comfortable in your body, allowing yourself to drop out of your head so that you are able to be present, but also that you're able to be present in your entire body with our learning today. So with that reconnection with each other and those deep breaths, come back into the room to our visual and audio presentation and our connection with each other. Welcome. 
Today, uh, we will have an opportunity um, to introduce ourselves to each other briefly, just get a sense of who we are, where we are, and how we were drawn to come together for this learning, this dialogue today. Um, most of you know uh, about Rian's work uh, with Domination and Partnership, but I will review that very briefly just to give us a context for moving into a new level of Earth Partnership. And also, um, for the sake of those who are new to our um, work and for the recording as well, we would like to just review very briefly um, this connection and context. The Earth Partnership practices themselves, we're just going to have a very short program overview of the next four weeks. Um, a little bit about um, uh, our objectives, our learning goals, um, what you can expect from these practices, a um, little bit of the benefits of joining these practices, what it means. And then we'll go deeply into the first two practices that are based on um, these certain qualities of, of the universe and of the earth. And one of them is called concentrating life force. And the other one we just call allurement and praise. So those that will be the first hour will be a little bit of review and um, moving into kind of our um, the series structure. The second hour will be going directly into these first two concepts. Then we'll look a little bit at next week and have time throughout our time together today for a bit of dialogue as well. Uh, if you do have questions for me, um, you can just type in the chat real quick. I do have a way that I can see the chat here on my iPhone. And if I miss a question, or Donna, if you see a hand up, if you would let me know, that would be great. Okay. Anne, yeah. I interrupt for one sure. second? I'm sorry, I stepped away to get water, so I didn't hear you earlier until I walked right back into the room. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but also... I don't know if everybody else's display is this, but all I see is your computer background with the practicing partnership. So I don't know if you're moving through the slides, if that's my computer, if everybody's seeing the same thing. Um, I should be on the slide now that has a picture of me and says you're a facilitator. Are other people seeing that now? I'm only seeing now viewing Ann Amberg's screen, so it's not the full it's not the full thing. And if anybody else is seeing what Anne is describing, can you put into the chat box that you're seeing that? And maybe it's just on mine. Oh, yeah. Only only seeing original screenshot. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're not seeing the full screen. Okay. That's fine. Let me. Thank you, Beth. Now, I think that this should be. Well, there's you. Yeah. Let me just try again. Because I think it might have been paused, which is. Kind of curious because I thought I unpaused. <laughs> Is that working better? Uh, Are you there, Donna? I think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I un I muted myself accidentally. So <laughs> now we're seeing now we're seeing the slides, but they're like we can see the first one and what comes up next, and your meeting notes at the bottom. So it's oh, still not. That's full screen. Okay, that's really strange too. Oh, here um, we go. Oh, it went back. Okay, let me just um let me just quit out of PowerPoint and start it again because it's uh, maybe needs a refresher here. Oh, I see what's happening. Hold, hold on just a second here. <clears throat> that should be better, I think. Let me try again. Does that look good? Yeah, perfect. Now we're spot on. Yeah, I had, I have two, I have two monitors going, and, and that's what it's doing. I see. <laughs> well done. Well done. All right. Thank you, Donna, for notifying me of that. And. Um, most of you are familiar with me and my work. I'm um, currently the Associate Director for the Leadership and Learning Programs of the Center for Partnership Studies. I've been uh, working with my working partner here, Sarah Salty, who's a director of our leadership programs. We've been <clears throat> working together since about 2012 uh, with Rian Eisler. And um, I live here on Whidbey Island, Washington, which is just north of Seattle in the Pacific Northwest. And I love being here. It's a gorgeous day today. And um, I also am an artist 
and a holistic educator. Um, I've for many years I've worked with this material that is a connection between spirituality, science, art, and transformational studies, offering um, in-depth learning. Uh, particularly based on um, the work of several evolutionary philosophers, including Dr. Brian Swim, Thomas Berry, and then Rian's work in social systems, um, and several others. And I'm very interested in this intersection between holistic science and human consciousness and how we really are going to begin um, to partner with the earth in more conscious ways. Um, so I've been an online course facilitator and founded a program in 2013 called What Does the Universe Do? And a little bit of that material will be woven into our uh, presentation today. Um, but it will also be grounded in the, in the context of Rianne Eisler's work, in, especially through her book, uh, The Power of Partnership, and starting with her work in cultural transformation in The Chalice and the Blade. So we'll talk more about that. Um, and I also work with K through 12 teachers, developing professional development for them um, with the same material, very progressive um, eco-literacy learning. So that's just a bit about me. And I would love to hear just a little bit about you. And I, I might suggest that we each just offer a bit about ourselves, maybe one or two minutes fairly quickly here. And I've just offered some centering questions here. I don't think we'll have time for each person to go into each of these, but um, I'm particularly interested in um, how, what, what has drawn you to not only the Center for Partnership Studies work, but to this particular Earth Practices program, and also um, where you are, your place in your bioregion, and how you resonate and relate to your place, or possibly you don't. So that, that's a few of the questions that I would really love to hear from people. And um, I think I'll just maybe go down the list here. And if it's okay, Beth, I, I might start with you. And be sure to unmute when you share. Okay, thank you, Anne. Yeah. And um, yeah, my apologies to everyone. I'm only on for half an hour today, but I will listen to the recording and, um, and be back with you for the second session. Um, yeah, what drew me to this is that I've been living in Silicon Valley for half of my adult life, and I've really come to the understanding that while technology is a valuable tool, um, I'm really a person of the earth. And um, my greatest times in life have been spent either with my family out in the earth, or um, I interact incredibly well with wild animals for some reason. And... Um, and so I feel like I'm coming full circle where I have tried to readjust myself to the high tech thinking and their approach to the world and really realize that doesn't work for me. My mind immediately goes to how many people were enslaved to make my cell phone over in Africa while they were mining for all these things. Um, and that's not very popular around here. <laughs> Um, to bring those things up in conversation. Um, and so I really want to refresh my own relationship with the earth. And at a time, uh, I have a book coming out in two weeks, and uh, a lot of it is earth centered. And it ha is having a, a lot of people are resonating with it, even though it's not out, which I find amazing. But and I think it's because of our time. And um, I think it's time for us to really participate in our relationship with the earth. So thank you, Anne. I very much look forward to all the incredible offerings that, that you have for us. Yeah, thanks, Beth. I, I'm really excited to hear more about your book at some point. And I, I hope you'll share it with our group when it does. it is published and comes out. I appreciate it. Thank you. And can I ask you real quick, Beth, where are you located? What is a little bit about your bioregion there? Oh, well, right now I'm in Silicon Valley, but I will actually be moving to Portland, Oregon uh, at the um, the beginning of October. So I'll be going back and forth. I just needed more nature in the mix. <laughs> right. Yeah. Portland's lovely. Thank you. Welcome. And I'm glad you can join us for this first half an hour today. And I think next let's go to Colleen. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I was first introduced um, to Rian's work uh, when I worked at um, 
Well, I, I'm living in Georgia, um, north of Georgia and um, coming Georgia, north of Atlanta. And I was first introduced to the work when I was working at um, a center for um, ecology, uh, spirituality and earth education called Cedar Hill Enrichment Center, um, which has since closed. Um, however, um, I became an advocate. Um, conversation leader and um, the center, um, it, it's a beautiful center, um, but being in Georgia, um, I don't necessarily <laughs> resonate um, with where I live other than um, a few locations. Um, and I'm hoping to learn how to how to reach out to people and have the conversations that really matter about um, the earth and ecology. And um, I'm hoping that I find a way to uh, introduce this in this area again. Um, and I'm also feeling very connected to, um, I think Cedar Hill will um, revive and um, I'm hoping to bring it back there. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And um, Colleen also shared with me earlier that that even though they did experience a bit of the Irma hurricane there that she's okay. So that's good to know. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Colleen. I'm so glad you could join our group today. Very, ha very happy to have you with us. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, let's go next to Donna. Good morning. Um, let's see. I stumbled across the Center for Partnership Studies on Facebook and enrolled in one class and then have become a Center for Partnership Studies junkie. And I think I've taken all of their courses so far. <laughs> and um, it's really changed my life. Like I have known all of what Rian teaches for, you know, as long as I can remember in my life, even back down to a child. But I just didn't have the language. And so, you know, meeting Anne and Sarah and Rihanna has really changed things for me because now I have a language to put out there and communicate with other people. And that's what I do. I'm a relationship builder um, and communicator. And I bring people together um, in mutually beneficial relationships or whatever that looks like, partnerships. Um, I live on the Palouse in Idaho, in northern Idaho. I live um, right across from uh, Pullman, Washington, about 75 miles south of Spokane, Washington, and Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I grew up in San Diego, so I grew up next to the beautiful beach, and I never thought I would live anywhere next to, other than next to the beach. But I moved up here 10 years ago, and it's stunningly beautiful here if you – are interested in Googling the Palouse. It's a really beautiful area, but it doesn't speak to my heart. I've traveled um, to England and Anne knows my story about being in England. And when I landed in Heathrow and I walked out, it was like my cells dropped to their knees and tears filled my eyes. Like, I don't know what it is about that land, but it resonates with me in such a deep ancestral way. And it's my plan to move over to England so I can be closer to where my heart beats with the earth. And as I was studying small farms and food systems and sustainability efforts around the um, world, I look at that triple, you know, that three-legged stool that talks about people, planet, and profit, and I put them in an order where it should be planet, people, and profit, because without the planet, there's no need for having people. So we have, we have no, we have no, there's nothing for us if we don't take care of our planet and without people there's no reason for having profit so profit should always come last under those three uh, they build upon each other and um, so that's the kind of work I do I'm a massage therapist by trade but I'm also starting multiple little projects that um, have to do with compassion and elevating how we human well in um, uh, in collaboration with uh, partnership studies. And I am just uh, willing to learn whatever I find uh, valuable in this beautiful session with um, you all. Thank you, Donna. And um, I love that you shared a description with us of your place there, the Palouse. I always, when I visit, which is very seldom, but just uh, last month when I 
visited, I was just also stunned by the amazing beauty of that place. But yet, culturally, it would be difficult for me to live there. So, um, yes, and thank you for all the ways that you contribute to our work at CPS. And um, looking forward to hearing more of your thoughts as we go forward. And let me just look here. Um, Heidi, go ahead. Hello. Um, so yes, I live on Orcas Island. So I feel incredibly blessed to live in a space of our region that speaks to me. I grew up in Alaska though, um, but I'm certainly still connected to that um, space as well. And I, for the past, uh, I guess it's this is going into just its second year, I've been the managing editor of the Interdisciplinary Journal of Partnership Studies. So, but I've known of uh, Rianne's work since the early 90s when I was in college and in women's programs and reading her work. Um, so I'm grateful to finally be actively involved um, with the work. My other um, professional role this time is I've been for the last six years, I work with the Center for World Indigenous Studies. So certainly there's always ways of weaving in more elements of partnership um, with regards to indigenous and the planet. And I also, I have a four-year-old son and founded a uh, four school here on Orcas three years ago um, that he, where he goes as well. And that's been another way for me to engage certainly in partnership education um, and actually wrote an article that will be coming out in this uh, upcoming issue of the journal that talks about that for school and partnership education. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Heidi. I think it's really lovely the work that you're doing with the Forest School and with education. And I'm so glad that you are a part of our group. And um, many of you do know about um, Interdisciplinary Journal for Partnership Studies, and we'll include that in a link in your follow up email too. Um, if you're not familiar with it, so that you can access all the wonderful articles um, and commentary in there on partnership applications. Thanks, Heidi. And let's go next to JT, Jason. And be sure to, oh, there you are. <laughs> and could we allow everyone else to go and then come back to me? Sure. Um, just about to walk into work. I don't want to be awkward. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. You're a mobile guy. <laughs> well, welcome, June. I'm so glad that you've joined our session, and it looks like your microphone is unmuted, so it would be a good time to introduce yourself just very briefly and uh, to the group. So go ahead. Oh, oh now you're muted. Or you're muted now. So Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh. Did you say June? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I didn't understand what happened with Jason. And so, hi, everybody. <laughs> hi. <laughs> I'm June, and I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. And um, uh, I resonate more with uh, where Colleen and Donna are from than I do actually with this bioregion. Um, grew up in Wisconsin and feel much more connected to the deep woods in the back back hills there where I grew up in southern Wisconsin. And um, so um, how am I involved with advocacy for partnership education or how did I discover? So I discovered Rian Eisler's work, you know, 20 years ago, I can't remember. And um, eventually I think Anne and I met through the Pachamama Alliance. We co-facilitated the symposium you know, 10 years ago, and um, I've just been seeking uh, to get myself trained by the great thought leaders of our time so that I can be the best catalyst for social transformation that I am able to be. And um, I, I, I would say that I find my skills at working with other people to be um, very different than what's normal. And so how uh, can I explain this in a short fashion? Um, I've worked in a collectively managed co-op for five years where we did consensus-based decision-making process. And um, I'm 
I find it challenging to interface with the larger society where uh, group process is entirely different and bringing different voices in is not valued. Um, efficiency is valued, scale is valued, so forth and so on. And so I'm eager to learn about uh, how to be a better partner with other people as well as other uh, with the earth itself. And um, so uh, I live in city and I don't actually resonate with where I live. Um, and I'm wanting to expand that in my life. Um, what I'm hoping to receive, I think I spoke to that. And then um, I'm in a space of just being really open to what's next for me. Like, uh, I believe it was Connie, I, you earn your living working with bodies as massage therapists. I'm a deep tissue body worker. I do something that is the synthesis of Rolfing and Feldenkrais and Zen Buddhism and a bunch of different things synthesize. It's called Zen body therapy. And um, I am really happy to be earning a living that way. It's gratifying and it's a, it's a quite a gift to really help people get out of pain and learn about their bodies and learn to be more present in their bodies. And it teaches me every time I work with people um, but I, I really have a deep longing to um, use my voice in service of the great turning, of the great transformation, and I'm looking for what that is. So how do I envision applying it? I'm, it's a big question mark for me, and I'm excited to see. And I'm most excited to be in a community of learners. Thank you for including me in this group. I'm very, ha very, very happy to be here. Thank you. Oh well, yeah, it's our it's my pleasure, June. I'm very glad you're you're joining our little cohort today, and hopefully we'll be with you in the coming weeks as well. And I really enjoyed uh, meeting June years ago and our work together with Pachamama, and so glad that you've kind of reconnected <laughs> with me and with oh. CPS. And um, we're all, I think, everybody here on this call is is educate our educators, and we're wanting to uh, catalyze this new worldview that that we want and we see emerging, and kind of remove the obstacles to that partnership that we that we want to see at all these different levels of society. So I really deeply appreciate your work in the world, June, and um, and yeah, it, it was Donna that mentioned that she's a massage therapist, and and your body work sounds really fascinating, June. I'd like to learn more sometime. Good. So. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Let's go next to, and, and be sure to um, mute your microphone, uh, June, when you're not speaking. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Mario, if you're there, go ahead and have a little quick introduction. <clears throat> well, uh, my name is really Mario Galvan. I come from a Mexican family. And uh, <clears throat> I uh, discovered uh, Rianne Eisler and her work. Um, many years ago when a friend of mine lent me uh, the book Sacred Pleasure. I was just uh, blown away by the depth of her knowledge and uh, the history and mythology and uh, you know, the changes in religion you know, as the dominator uh, philosophy uh, swept over the world at that time uh, in the past. Um, so, um, I, uh, I've been working uh, for many years now with uh, the Zapatista movement in Mexico. So I've gotten a real close look at, uh, you know, the indigenous approach to understanding the world and living in uh, harmony with it. Um, the other thread, I guess, that ties me to this is uh, my work for social change, uh, which uh, kind of started when I came, uh, became politically aware, as I like to call it, uh, during the Vietnam War and started uh, questioning, uh, you know, where is this society going and why does it do what it does? Um, so um, uh, that, of course, leads to, uh, in my case, uh, led to uh, political work. Uh, I was recently a candidate for Congress unsuccessfully. Uh, just talking about, uh, you know, the idea of a partnership 
in fact, uh, offering a, uh, a political uh, philosophy that would uh, let everyone participate as opposed to our current political system that lets one party win uh, and then uh, excludes the voices of everyone else in that district who don't belong to that party. <clears throat> I want to mention just in passing that I uh, discovered along the way that in our uh, House of Representatives of 435 districts, there are only around 50 uh, independent, or let's just say districts in the United States that are not rigged for one party or the other. So even then, as we go into our elections and they say, oh, vote and uh, do, your, do your civic duty, uh, the, the, our political system is set up in favor of the current political parties. So it's a big log jam. And so I've been thinking about, you know, how do we break this conceptual log jam or prison? You know, I, I love that movie, The Matrix, where he, uh, Morpheus says, oh, you were born into a prison, you know, an imprisonable a prison you can't see or feel, uh, and prison for your mind. And um, maybe because of my work with the Zapatistas and, uh, you know, other people I've met around the world in the little bit I've been able to travel, <clears throat> I've come to think of the earth as the thing that ties us all together. I mean, it's one of the few things that, I mean, if everyone in the world just walked outside and touched the earth, we would all be linked, you know, by the planet, even though we're divided by culture, language, nationality, and all of the ideas that clutter our minds. So uh, anyway, I'm hoping in this uh, session to uh, just learn from others. Uh, I'm always impressed by the people who participate in these uh, conferences. And um, I just would like to finish by saying, uh, I really uh, love nature. Uh, and, you know, when I think of relating to the earth, to me that uh, includes the cosmos as well. Uh, I was uh, just to <laughs> just to drive that home and no pun intended, but I just drove up to uh, visit the Arctic Circle uh, going through Canada. Uh, I almost went to Whidbey Island uh, <laughs> where I visited before to be with friends. Um, and uh, on my way home, I was able to uh, uh, experience the total eclipse, uh, which really had a powerful impact on me. And, um, uh, you know, when we say, uh, you know, our relationship to the earth, I think we really mean that's our key to relating to the entire cosmos. And um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here with you, Anne, and with all of you who uh, I have yet to meet uh, and to know well. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mario. And I really honor your uh, social activism, political activism, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about your your uh, reflections on our material as we're as we're dialoguing. And can you remind me very briefly again where you live? You probably did say that, and I might have missed it. No, I didn't. I forgot that part. Okay. I live in Sacramento, California, which is in the middle of. Um, I, uh, you know, we we have a funny division here. We call it Northern and Southern California, but. Um, the northern part of California is that we have this huge bathtub of a valley. So I have mountains on both sides. Mm -hmm. Sacramento is right in the middle. So mm -hmm. if I drive a couple of hours to the east, I can be up in the mountains at Lake Tahoe or even in Yosemite a little farther south. Uh, or if I go west uh, in two hours, I can be at the ocean, at the beach, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, go to the redwoods and all of that. So I'm in a fantastic uh, geographic location. And I really enjoy it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I loved my time driving through Sacramento, spending some time there. It's really beautiful. Thank you, Mario. And uh, let's go next to Sam. Go ahead, Sam. Hi. 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 Uh, this is my first uh, class with um, your organization. And I've been on your email list for many years. And um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm a learning specialist in Menlo Park. Excuse me, excuse me, could you speak up louder, please? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for saying something. Thanks, June. <laughs> yeah, your voice was a little bit soft, but just a little little bit more would be would be great. Thanks, Sam. Okay, tell me if you need to be even louder. I think it sounds good now. <clears throat> okay, great. Yes, so first class with you. 
Um, I am a learning specialist in Menlo Park, which is also in Silicon Valley, uh, right on the wetlands. Um, and um, I um, have been working independently for about 15 years. I was um, heavily informed by Parker Palmer's nonprofit, the Center for Courage and Renewal, which um, has informed my teaching a lot. And uh, right now I'm in a moment of growth in my business. And I've uh, developed a, a wonderful team of five people that are really excited about the kind of education we provide. And uh, we're starting to be more conscious about structuring our, our team culture and calling it an awareness-based team culture. And what does that mean and how do we structure that? And I'm very interested in grounding that in earth awareness, in addition to other types of awareness, creative awareness, other kinds. Uh, and so that's what drew me to this class. Great. Well, welcome from Menlo Park. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about the work that you're doing with your organization, Sam, and very honored to have you here with our group today. Thank you. Yeah. So, welcome, welcome. And, uh, JT, are you around that you want to say a quick hello, or is it convenient? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. I appreciate uh, everyone cooperating. I'm a lifeguard at the Rivers Club, and as I was walking into work to start listing off my experience, it would have sounded odd to those around me. <laughs> Yet I am a student at the Thunderbird School of Global Management with Arizona State University, a recent graduate of the O'Connor College of Law and have been working with Rianne and Sarah and Ann and Leah and all the wonderful people in the community at the Center of Partnership Studies for quite a number of years now. I advocate for a cultural transformation centered or grounded in transforming our economic systems and our financial institutions, hopefully having the greatest impact on our uh, educational uh, imprisonments. <laughs> higher educational institutions. I am excited to be working or joining and working with the folks on this call in this cohort with nature as I have been picking up a couple of books that I'm trying to work into my global management uh, rhetoric or course load with uh, uh, Ms. Schuler's Inner Peace Global Impact on Tibetan Buddhism, Leadership and Work and Pastor Young's Economics, Ecology and God. Uh, uh, another approach to uh, some ideas of Adam Smith that I know Rian touches heavily on. So these are things that I'm hoping to work. I often approach or bring the <laughs> scope of biomimicry to my caring economy conversations. And I think that being able to expand that with a deeper language of nature and the reflective uh, work that that has on everything that we do learn and understand will just make even greater impact. So thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, JT. And are you living in Arizona now? Or are you still living in Pittsburgh or a little yeah. bit of both? Right. I am in Pittsburgh. I do travel a lot. I <laughs> am doing an apprentice with Thomas Hubel in the Pocket Project, if anyone's familiar. And I just have to put a plug in there for Rianne that I often say, like, when I'm traveling so much, I think we need, like, a Gideon stamp to put on the front of her books and just leave a trail everywhere <laughs> we go. Because it, it, it's, it's really what, you know, motivates and truly drives me is that we get this work into yeah. the conversations that other people are having already. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> I really want to thank JT also for your advocacy for the work of CPS, and he's also just an amazing pollinator of Rian's work, and you're always uh, sending books here and there to your different contacts <laughs> in the country. Uh, so we really deeply appreciate that you're really an amazing spokesperson, JT, and also your incredibly diverse um you know, education skills and your leadership skills and also the way that you bring spirituality together with eco-literacy at this kind of social cultural scale is, is really unique. And we're all doing that in our own way, in our own place. So thank you so much, everyone, for introducing yourselves to our group. And I think it's, it's really interesting for each person in the group to get a sense of, of where we are in the kind of leadership, um, the kind of holistic approaches that we're, we're involved with in our, in our place. And did you have a quick question, June? Yeah, I, I have a request. I think it could contribute to the whole group. 
Um, I'm a, an extremely visual and kinesthetic learner. So when people say words, I just say words, 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 it's almost like drowning for me. And uh, I wonder if there are other visual learners on the call. It's helpful if you slow down a little bit and pause. J uh, Jason just said amazing things that I couldn't track because it went too fast. I was just going to ask him to slow down a little bit so I could um, translate what he's saying and comprehend it. That's that's a need that I have that will support me in this group and perhaps others as well. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, June. It, it is true that <clears throat> I think I, I do this too, that when we're on a uh, on online technology, we tend to kind of get going and uh, kind of get revved up and like we're on a little momentum, like a little rat in a cage or something. <laughs> so um, it's very, very important for us to be grounded and to receive our learning fully. So I appreciate your feedback. And I think we'll go forward here. Um, and what I'd like to do is in the next 15 minutes, move fairly quickly through this base contextual uh, material that just offers a bit about the work of CPS. And I, I think that, Sam, you might be the only one on our call that is not really, really familiar with CPS. So um, if you have any questions as I go through this, um, please do put a quick note in the chat. And then, of course, our recording of our session will be made available to all of you. It will probably be later in the day or first thing tomorrow, and you'll be able to go back. And as I said again, I also include links to our websites and our program material in our follow-up email. So um, many of you are very familiar with Rian Eisler's work. She founded the Center for Partnership Studies, I think, over 20 years ago or, or more. Um, and her centering question with her life experience and her social work and social systems she is asking this question, since humans have such capacity for consciousness, caring, and creativity, why has our world seen so much cruelty, insensitivity, and destructiveness? And we're seeing it now, of course, uh, politically and in many other ways. Um, this is a centering question for her body of work in the world that, that kind of started um, in the public sphere with her, her book, The Chalice and the Blade, which came out in 1988. And in fact, um, that book is being reissued again at the end of this month as a 30th anniversary edition for 2018. We're very excited about that. And all of you, um, <clears throat> I think you're all on our mailing list. <coughs> Excuse me. And you will receive information about how we're celebrating that 30th anniversary of her work. Um, <clears throat> in the chalice and the blade. As we um, offer our leadership and learning program, <coughs> as, as we offer our dialogues, we're finding um, that we really want to open a conversation as leaders about the vision that we hold that's a progressive vision. And resistance is really, really a huge part of how we're raising awareness. But we find that sometimes it's not enough because if we don't have <clears throat> a shared vision or a vision that's grounded with our larger context, which is the earth and the universe itself, then it really isn't enough because, because when we're just in an oppositional place, we're kind of maintaining um, that duality stance, that oppositional stance of, of, of us against them or one thing or another thing. And the consciousness and transformation we're moving towards is not binary in that way. It's, it's really partnership. So it's really important for us to do this um, social and political activism and to raise awareness. But we, our conversation today particularly will go into a slightly different sphere of consciousness. Um, and this new perspective is, as, as Mario was, was kind of uh, so elegantly saying, it really is grounded in a much larger context of home as, as universe, home as earth, and human identity on a more planetary scale. And it's a very um, new perspective. It's a new worldview, and it's a bit subversive because we really are kind of in a regressive stage at this point. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, 
So in this um, lens that Rian has been um, putting forth in her domination and partnership theory, these social systems, um, they really do reveal patterns that are otherwise not visible. If you can really see a little bit of where you are individually, where a group of people is on a scale from domination systems and patterns and behaviors going towards partnership, we're all on this interesting continuum. And I think most of you would probably agree that um, that when these big cultural regression, times of regression uh, arise as they are now, this is what we might think of as cultural shadow material. So there is um, a lens that, uh, you know, kind of a depth psychology lens, a uh, cultural transformation lens we can look through to understand things in a little bit more of a deep time uh, perspective rather than a short term perspective and get a sense of how this this cultural shadow material could actually be helping to lead us into a shared progressive vision that that where we're stating a little bit more clearly uh, as a group, as humans together, what we really want for human society. So uh, socially and culturally, no society, of course, is a pure partnership or a pure domination system. But these patterns that are not normally visible um, become more visible when you kind of get a sense of, of, of differences with society. Some societies um, throughout history and currently are brutally repressive and violent. Um, we all know what those societies are and what's happening there. Um, those kind of exemplify the core configuration of a domination system. And um, if you want to learn more about some of Rian's specific work on domination and partnership, definitely visit the CPS website, centerforpartnership.org. There's a, a huge body of information there and, and including educational and curriculum um, systems. Um, but more equ equitable and peaceful societies, um, ancient societies or other prehistoric cultures um, that are mentioned in the Chalice and the Blade or modern cultures and um, countries such as Sweden, Norway and Finland, these adhere more closely to a partnership systems core configuration. Let's take a look at that. So the domination system, of course, um, as we know, is based on this kind of um, uh, pyramid system, and, and I really uh, appreciate what you had said, Donna, about uh, planet people and, and uh, profit, that um, the domination system, of course, is about <laughs> profit. It's really about power um, over others, so it really um, reflects these kind of rigid hierarchies of domination. There's a hierarchical structure that, that has to do with power over, so you're you are, that that means that there's going to be victims. You, you either have power or you don't. There's these kind of rankings that are involved in this domination culture, and there's really no choice other than to dominate or be dominated. And the domination um, behavioral patterns start within the family structure itself. Um, partnership is. Uh, it has a different sense to it, has a different feeling in the body, has different outcomes relationally. But a partnership system um, um, rests on more flexible um, structures. And here Rian is saying hierarchies of actualization. And I, I wouldn't even use that word hierarchy. I would just say kind of a relational um, approach socially where each individual's actualization or, or full whole, uh movement towards wholeness is honored and supported. So this is rather than power over, this is power with. And we'll be talking more about this when we talk about earth partnerships. So the emphasis is on linking together on interrelationship and not on separation or ranking. And then of course, partnership nurtures and sustains life rather than dominates or, or objectifies nature and life. Let's move forward. And in a partnership society, in a partnership framework, we're really talking about mutually enhancing relationships. And our focus in this series is these relationships between humans and earth, humans and nature, humans and other than humans. 
So this quote by Rian, I really like a lot. And she says, we are all part of an exquisitely interwoven web of life that is part of a resurging partnership consciousness. Deep inside, we all carry this consciousness. It lies behind the profound connection many of us feel with nature. And this partnership consciousness is who we are at our core. It is what we were born with. It is, it is how we evolved out of the earth. Um, but our modern industrial consciousness is kind of colonializing us in a way that uh, we, we really, it's easier to forget about this core partnership consciousness and deep intimacy that we have with the earth. Um, there are so many aspects of our modern industrial society that are kind of abstracting us. Uh, it's, it is a little bit like the matrix that Mario had mentioned. We're kind of in this box universe, but that's not actually the way the universe is, but uh, it, we feel like we are separated from nature. And um, that has lots of consequences individually and socially. Um, one, when I, when I saw, uh, when I heard Thomas Berry speak many years ago in the 1990s here in Seattle, he would be considered, um, a, a cultural, uh, ecologist or what people say are, is a geologian. He's a, his cultural, <clears throat> his, his, his history leader, but he's really somebody who sees deep time, deep space and human cultures in this deep universe context. And he had put forth this metaphor at that time of this lifeboat, that if humans are in a lifeboat <laughs> and the boat itself is the earth, but the boat has a hole in it and is sinking, what is the first priority? Is it the lifeboat or is it the humans in the boat? And I think as Donna had mentioned earlier, we really have to begin to shift our perception where we are giving priority to the health of the earth as this kind of lifeboat because it is our home. It's the only place that we have. Um, and this shift that we are wanting to move to this ecocentric worldview, um, we, it, it really gives us an opportunity to understand that the earth uh, is our primary economy. It's our primary foundation. So um, a response that goes beyond a human-focused worldview, which is has been our domination framework, a, a approach that goes beyond that will reflect a long-term, more eco-centric thinking. Um, so really, of course, uh, the core tenet of partnership is the truth of the interconnectedness of all life. So this is kind of a... <clears throat> Uh, a humorous way to move into a question of human identity. But because right now we're in a regressive, um, not only political, but in terms of our social consciousness and social systems, we're really beginning to question our, our, our isolation, our separateness. We're questioning who we are as humans. But partnership offers us an opportunity to begin to think beyond more limited identifications. And it's very, um, we're very familiar with identifying um, as an individual. Maybe we're identifying as our role as a mother or a father in our family. We might have a role in community or in our work life that we identify. We might identify with a corporation. And we might identify as a citizen of a particular country. But what I'm offering in this um, consciousness shift is an identification actually as um, an earth human, as planetary human. And that would require us kind of coming together to decide how we want to be as a, as a species. And that question hasn't really come up for us before. I mean, we can't even really get together on the is issue of climate change. And this is one of the reasons we we're not able to because we're not thinking together as a species quite yet. Um, so this, this uh, image here kind of questions our, says, what is our role as humans? There's lots of options. And our modern industrial consciousness has put forth a few of these options. And a lot of us are following these. One, one option is to be a consumer. Um, but really, you kind of have to question, has, has the universe been 
evolving for 14 billion years just to create consumers. <laughs> Another a possibility is that we could just abandon the earth and populate an off-world colony. Um, another option is to kind of stay in denial about what's happening around us and to keep partying, um, to use uh, what some people have called these mass weapons of distraction. <laughs> another possibility is to technologically engineer all of life so that we don't have to worry about earth systems, that we just manage those systems and manage ourselves through technology. This is the idea that technology will save us. But a thought that I would like to put forth that is really inspired by the work of cosmologists and ev evolutionary philosophers like Brian Swim and Thomas Berry is perhaps our role could be to experience the depths of things so we can enhance the flourishing of the Earth community, which includes humans. So all of these options are very different, but the last one is it feels different. And that's kind of the direction we want to go in this conversation, in this series. We want to go into the direction of new narratives, new embodied consciousness, and a new story. Um, and that's really the work of the Center for Partnership Studies, is just helping us find language, images, uh, stories, and experiences that can begin to offer a new experience that goes beyond the old domination paradigm. So moving forward here, and we're going to take a break in just a minute. Um, and this is kind of what we've been talking about. Um, we are embedded in, a, in an evolving sacred ecology, and I want to use that word sacred in our conversation, not as being religious, but as being spiritual. So a deep felt sense in the body of this truth of the interconnectedness with everything and, and the reverential stance that we want to take to this beautiful um, ecological system that the earth has been building up for over four million years and the and the mystery in that um, and that and that it is evolving and that we're evolving with it and maybe there's a part that we can actually take to play in that evolution we don't actually have to remove ourselves as an unattached observer, this is what reductionist science would like us to do, is to not play a role in the evolution of these ecological systems. But with partnership, we're saying that we do feel accountable towards the continuity of this beauty. And we do want to partner with the earth. So it is possible to learn to work and evolve in partnership with these core life systems um, these are ecological principles and dynamic cosmological qualities to release outmoded domination patterns and nurture our birthright as planetary humans. So there's a lot of ideas in that one little sentence. And it may seem like we're a really long way from, from what we see with uh, these kind of limited domination uh, power over regressive stances that, that's happening socially. But um, as I think a lot of us are seeing, we want our awareness to come up of what we don't want <laughs> so that we, we can begin to state with, with new language and new experiences what we do want. So uh, in really the, the sense is that in this time of radical change, of loss and uncertainty, that an informed and committed relationship with the earth directly will ground our action, our social action, our education. So truly what I have found in practicing partnerships with the earth is that nature is really available to engage with us in unexpected ways. And, some, and it's just lovely and fun and um, incredible. So that's what we're exploring. Um, we know that the personal is political, and we also know now that the political is Earth. Earth is our primary economy. Um, so, so some of these evolutionary philosophers have have offered the, this this idea that that possibly the role of the human is to enable the creative powers of the universe, these qualities and dynamics that nature does, to proceed in a new way that's more mutually enhancing 
in which we can actually co-evolve in partnership with what the earth does. And it's really questioning the earth, approaching the earth as a partner and saying, can we participate with what you're doing? Um, and then we also want, I also want to just say that when we are beginning to take a look at these basic cosmological dynamics, these are things that have come out of evolutionary science. We'll, we'll get into this in our next hour here. Um, but the basic things that the universe does, one of them, for example, is gravity. And gravity is um, a quality. It kind of just is. It's really primal. It's at the very base of, of what it means to be human. But it doesn't have any particular ethical or moral structure around it. It's not about domination or partnership. It's just uh, quality. It's just what the universe does. So at the level of human consciousness, which is kind of new um, in the universe, it's kind of new on the earth. It's really only been around maybe, uh, I don't know, 40,000, 50,000, 100,000 years of human consciousness has been evolving. But um, <clears throat> human consciousness itself is what brings this kind of ethical or moral uh, framework to our decisions and how we are on the planet. And one of the very first ecologists, Aldo Leopold, has famously said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. And a thing is wrong when it tends otherwise. So this is a, um, what he would call the land ethic. And this has been a great um, inspiration for ecology moving forward. And when we apply this understanding to working with the powers of the universe, this is where our human consciousness, our moral and our land ethic comes in. And this is where the ethic and morality of partnership comes in and where we just begin to make choices and understand why we're bringing these particular values. These are partnership values. And I'm not going to go through <clears throat> this entire list, um, but uh, you will, as I said, receive a copy of these slides and also the recording. And um, just the idea that I want to convey that, that I think we're all on the same page here is that partnership values do actually extend beyond the social sphere. And um, we are really quite familiar with Rian's work, very strongly focused in the social sphere. And many of you are at work um, with policy change and social movements. But as we're all seeing so clearly, especially with the um, uh, influences of climate change, um, with our food security issues, agriculture, um, and just this loss of connection to nature, we're seeing that the partnership values must extend beyond the social sphere. And um, what we want to do is we want to think about how these mutually beneficial relationships not only work at the social and cultural level, but can in fact help to nurture um, the actualization of healthy, self-regulating planetary cycles. So it's not only that we're stewards for the earth or we're caring for the earth. That's important. But I think in, in my conversation with partnership, I want to go a little step beyond that um, into not just caring for, but caring with. So that's a language shift that is a little bit like the power over power with the language shift in partnership. So just um, beginning to get a sense of how our conversation with the earth itself and how the earth can let us know how to partner with it. And um, with these qualities of what the earth does, we're, our objective is really to align our actions with nature's ancient ways of knowing. And it's very, um, sometimes we have to do, we have to go to a little bit of effort. We have to take some, some work to remember what those ancient ways of knowing are. They're, they're not just indigenous, what we think of as indigenous ways of knowing, but that's definitely a big part of it. But they're just, they even go in a more primal level before human culture. This is just really what the universe does. And um, in order for us to evolve, with uh, the aims of the universe, <laughs> we 
you know, like like the slide that we had earlier about the choices of what what's our role as humans. We, we could trash the planet and then leave it. I mean, that's an option, but we, but that's not going to bring us joy. It's just going to, um, it's just going to be so degrading and destructive. And that's kind of the direction we're starting to go because we've really forgotten who we are in terms of nature's ancient ways of knowing. And so I just want to make a quick note here about how the practices that I'm going to introduce have been developed. These really are drawn from a combination of modern Western approaches to indigenous ways of knowing, as well as mindfulness practices, eco-psychology, soul-based nature inquiry, and that will actually include self-designed ceremony, and also um, some of my own original personal practices that are inspired by depth psychology and conversation directly with the natural world. So I think what I might do right now is uh, just offer a little bit of time for us to take a quick break. And just about four minutes. And uh, let's see if I, if I can set that. So you should be seeing on your screen um, a little timer here, if that makes sense. And we'll just take a quick break. It's about 11 after 11 o'clock. So right around 11.15, let's gather back. And I'll see you in about four minutes.
Okay, welcome back to our session. And I just might have people put a quick note in the chat if you are back with us here. Just say I'm here and Donna's back. And thanks, Donna. Just wait just a minute to be sure that people are back with us. Thanks, Heidi and June and Colleen, JT, um, Mario. That's great. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So it's about 11.15. Uh, we have about 45 minutes, and I am going to go forward, but I'm not going to kind of rush, and I do, maybe we'll just take a quick minute here. Does anybody have any uh, quick comment or question, or are you a little bit lost, or do you have a burning thing you'd like to share? Um, you could either put it in the chat, or uh, we'll just maybe take a couple minutes, maybe three minutes, to if anybody has something they'd like to share before we move forward here. This is June. I'm just wanting to say that um, this just, just makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> this, just, um, this makes me so happy. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's great, June. And um, yeah, this it's is just your... What I, just what I need at just the right time. Good. Find my bearings and to um, uh, the tools and resources and language to help me move in the direction I'm deeply called to move, but haven't quite um, sorted out. Um, anyway, I can't put it into words, but I'm just deeply grateful. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm so grateful to have you here with us, June. And this is where we all live is at the level of body and feeling and how can we just shut ourselves off from feeling because you know this is part of what we're going to talk about and one of our earth partnership practices is about feeling and um it sure is easy to be detached from that world when you're in this world of technology and when you're dealing with the current social cultural climate upheaval it's this is um well, it's a time of grief, and we'll be talking more about that in the, I think it's the third session. Anybody else have a comment or just anything before we move forward? Okay. Let's go forward here. So, um, this work, um, we're going to talk more about the origination of these 10 primal earth patterns. But um, right now, we just want to be really clear that, that the framework or the structure that I'm, that I'm offering to enter these earth partnership practices is kind of hanging on this framework of 10 things that the universe does. This is the material that I've been working with since about 2002. And... Um, also, when I was in England in 2003, I partnered with Brian Swim and we kind of co-taught this residential course that was kind of multifaceted and part of it was, was about the powers of the universe and part of it was about modern art and uh, cultural change. And then the other part was about Gaia theory and eco-literacy. So all three of those was um, a part of this three-week residential course. And so that was a time when these ideas with, with Brian Swim and, and other holistic scientists were being deeply developed in more of an embodied way, not just conceptually. Um, and this was um, a kind of an exciting time, uh, right about a year after that is when the DVD series called The Powers of the Universe first came out. And I'll include links for that resource in your follow-up email. But um, these 10 things that the universe does, we can kind of think as, of as a guiding compass for navigating a shift towards a more Earth-friendly way of being. And um, so really, 
moving into this feeling of this, um, really to locate ourselves in this expansive context of deep space and deep time into the universe story itself, is to acknowledge that we are wild. We are each unfathomable and magnificent formations of this life force that's moving through us all the time. We are complicit with and maybe even drawn to connection with these particular essential qualities of nature, maybe the personality of nature, we might say. Um, and we, in fact, are the primal biodynamic patterns of the universe learning how to practice partnership. So that is an interesting thought, isn't it? Um, and I'll say that again. We are, in fact, these primal patterns of the universe in this process of learning how to practice partnership with the earth. So you might say that the universe and the earth itself through the human species is practicing this large cultural individuation process. So that's a big mouthful of words, but if you're familiar a little bit with the work of Carl Jung and depth psychology and also um, soul practices that move us towards inner wholeness, this um, idea of individuation is a maturation in a spiritual um, a context where we begin to know that it's not about me, it's about we. Um, but yet we also have a real strong ego development, not in a negative sense, but in a sense of partnership and wholeness. And we're going to talk more about that when we talk about the first earth partnership practice. Um, so the, some of the, um, Inquiries. I'm not going to read through all of these. Uh, you, you can find this information too online, and I can send you this too in a follow-up email. But uh, but really, these practices are designed to help us align and co-evolve with these basic patterns in the Earth and the universe. Some of these, some of some of the um, dialogue we'll have is to talk about the links between climate change and this this. Um, new understanding that earth is truly our primary economy and how would our behaviors and actions change if we really lived um, understanding that. Um, the role of grief in these new human earth relationships. Um, and also how our, hold on a second here. And how our capacity for care is mirrored in our relationship to the earth as mother. So all of these um, inquiries are, are kind of take another step beyond the, the way that they're applied to how we think of social systems. We do a lot of work in the caring economy campaign of beginning to connect the, these, these, the, the, the dots, the, the kind of these kind of subtle assumptions and um, kind of domination worldview issues where we're just not making the, the work of care visible and valued in our economic system. This, of course, is connected to gender because most of the work of care, not all, but a lot of it is, has been done by women. Um, and a lot of the care of, of nurturance is, is done by women and, and child care as well. And if we don't understand the earth as our primary economy, it's going to be very difficult um, for us to begin to really have the resources to give value to the work of care because the economy is not just some abstracted thing that we've created as a, as a human uh, structure. It, it comes directly out of um, the way the earth, the earth nurtures us. So there are deep connections here that we have to, uh, have to kind of understand conceptually, begin to open to a new vision and understanding of, of this. So um, moving into um, a sense of these earth practices directly, um, the, the purpose of them is to really invite a new level of intimacy and conversation with the earth. Um, it's really easy to say that, but you'll see it as we move through these new concepts and practices that, that doing it and the embodied doing of it is what's really important and not just once or twice, but as a, as a practice. And when we begin to incorporate um, one or more of these practices into our everyday life, we are actually opening ourselves to being reshaped. And it's not just reshaped conceptually. Um, it's not just a worldview reshaping. That's, that's a pretty big deal. 
but it's also reshaping um, how we think of who we are in our felt sense, um, in our feelings, um, in our soul life. And of course, at the individual level, these are spiritual practices. And um, it brings up obstacles and shadow work because the ego doesn't like to be reshaped. <laughs> but in these earth practices, I also want us to be thinking about the social level and the cultural level of being reshaped into a new worldview and how threatening that is to the cultural ego. So we're seeing it. We're seeing it with our politics, with these crazy personalities we have on the world scene. Um, we're seeing it in lots of different negative ways. But to offer ourselves kind of on the chopping block, so to speak, <laughs> of being reshaped, it means asking for a little death here and there of maybe the way that who we thought we were. What is this new identity we're inviting? Who are we when we begin to ask the earth humbly to partner with us? So these are all big questions. And these are this is all food for thought. It is all something to metabolize in the coming weeks and to kind of let these ideas work us. Um, some of you might be familiar with the work of the Animus Valley Institute and Bill Plotkin. Um, they really are amazing at taking these old indigenous ways of knowing, rites of passage, um, and applying them to the modern Western um, cultural thought stream. And the work they do is outdoors. Um, one of Bill's most recent works called Wild Mind, he's talking about reclaiming our true nature. And he says, we must reclaim and embody our original wholeness our indigenous human nature granted to us by nature itself. We must dare again to dream the impossible and romance the world, to feel and honor our kinship with all species and habitats, to embrace the troubling wisdom of paradox, and to shape ourselves into visionaries with the artistry to revitalize our enchanted and endangered world. So this is what we're talking about. Um, and I think that, you know, this quote, daring to dream the impossible is a good starting place for any kind of committed earth partnership practice. And we're really asking this question, is it possible that the natural world could work alongside us in this endeavor, not as a coach, not as a guide, and not as a child that we're caring for, but as an equal as a friend who has a wealth of industry and experience to share. <laughs> so that is nature, and we know that. Um, and we don't know really nature's story. We only see things out of our own projected experience. So the inquiry we're, we're making with nature is, is coming to nature and saying, well, I, I see and feel and sense, but I might not really know your story or what your needs are. So very briefly, it's about uh, 1130, and very briefly, I'd like to just open a very short, maybe just five minutes opportunity for um, some comments or dialogue, or maybe some insights that might come up for you um, around this question, uh, where we're, we're saying directly, uh, inviting intimacy and conversation with the earth requires a reshaping inside ourselves. So does anybody have anything that comes up for them around that question? Um, a little comment in the chat is okay too. Or if you're confused about that or have want some clarification, good opportunity for that. You can move on if you'd like. I have a little comment, mm -hmm. um, Anne. Mm -hmm. uh, it just kind of, so I became an ambassador for that um, Charter for Compassionate Cities with the Women and Girls um, okay. group. And I had my first class this past Sunday uh -huh. with some, and we talked about trust um, and Brene Brown's anatomy of um, trust and what that looks like. Because if we don't trust ourselves, how do we, how do we um, offer trust to others? And how do right. we, if we know ourselves deeply and trust ourselves deeply, how right. do we, 
how do we create boundaries for ourselves in order to be in partnership with other people? And um, so inviting intimacy and conversation with the earth requires a reshaping inside of ourselves. And I agree, like everything that we choose to do and be in communion, um, in community, um, coming together as humans has to start with our own inner landscape and defining, like not just being dragged along behind society, but really defining who we are so that we can choose in which capacity we're going to engage, whether it's with each other or whether it's in partnership with um, our environment and the earth, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just my comment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Donna. That inner landscape and the trust that is just so much the perfect lead in for the first earth partnership practice. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. And, uh, and let me just move. Anybody else have a, have a comment before we go forward or a feedback or thought? Um, this is June in Kansas city. Again, um, what comes up for me is, um, something that you referenced earlier about the extent to which, our consciousness has been um, limited to cognitive and um, the references that you've made to the shift that, that we're looking for is an embodiment mm -hmm. that like we're talking about Brian Swim and so forth is that what comes up for me is that um, I barely know how to embody uh, I, I know how to think about sustainability and social justice and social transformation and so forth and so on. And the idea of, in, uh, of uh, inviting intimacy is really going to require reshaping inside of myself because uh, I realize the extent to which how I've lived and how I think and how I be has been so influenced by the dominator template, even though I've tried to move away from it and so forth and so on. And so I, I realized that the extent to which I, I've i made efforts to change and to grow are minuscule compared to what I think lies ahead in learning how to invite that intimacy and, and the practices. So that's what's mm -hmm. there for me. It's like, um, it's like the skinny branches, the scary, wow, I don't even know what this is. How do, how do I do this? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, June. That's so well articulated. That's exactly, that's kind of the, the sense I want us to carry with us is just this honesty about, wow, look how we've been shaped to live in our heads. And um, the more that technology get uh you know complexifies and becomes pervasive in our life the more that we're going to be you know we're going to be drawn to be to, to go away from our embodied felt sense knowing with the earth these are things that are beginning to atrophy um even for older people even for adults that have been raised with a childhood where you spent all of your time outside playing in, in nature which i did a lot uh, you know i mean younger people don't even necessarily have that gift today of being always out in nature playing as a child but even for people who have been raised that way as we move forward with our technologically driven world we're lifted and abstracted away from an embodied felt sense and a trust of who we are as earth beings so it's like with this um worldview shift we want to catch ourselves before we totally float away into this programming of this matrix that isn't based in anything that's real. We want to capture ourselves as leaders and educators and say, wait a minute, I want to come back to a real inner territorial integrity. And I want to know in my body where I stand with nature and with the earth itself. And these practices are designed to lead us directly that direction. And I'm seeing a quick note from JT here. Yeah, it's beautiful, JT. He says, sometimes when we grow in place, our container becomes stronger. It's too strong to hold the truth of that invitation. It's beautiful. Yeah, these are, um, you know, these are spiritual experiences 
a lot of which you can't and you don't even want to put words around or narrative around. It's mysterious. It's unknowable. But yet our body knows. So that's why these practices are quite embodied. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this program schedule. You can read about this online and in the slides when you get these. <clears throat> um, and I just want to talk very briefly about, we've started to come into this conversation, but some of the um, the benefits of, of earth partnership practices that um, we, we want these practices to help to inform and ground your social activism and your leadership and your education leadership. Um, we, we, we really are hoping that you begin to feel an expanded sense of belonging and identity. Um, and that's why, um, that's part of the reason that earth partnership practices do, um, emphasize a sense of place. Where are you living? What is your bioregion? Even if you don't like, and where you're living or all aspects of your bioregion, just to, just to get a sense of um, how your belonging uh, lives there and how that can be expanded into the sense of who you are as a cosmological being. And then as um, uh, Donna mentioned, and really June as well, trusting in our own deep experience, um, an ability to listen and act within a shared feel of knowing. So this is these are capacities that have to do with systems thinking. Um, another thing that's not taught in schools <laughs> or anywhere really uh, in our cultural experience, there are great teachers like Rian and Fritjof Capra is another. Um, JT mentioned biomimicry, the work of Janine Benyus, and many others are helping us to see what nature does through this lens of systems thinking. But it isn't um, in the domination system, it's not about systems thinking at all. It's about uh, reductionism and separation. So that that right there is is a is a capacity we want to focus on. It's, it's not only systems thinking, but systems um, relation re relationships, re relational capacities and systems. Um, another benefit is agility with change. This is so huge. And if you're a coach or a leader, somebody who is working with groups of people, we're really understanding now that we have to be prepare for huge environmental changes, huge political and social changes, maybe even lifestyle changes that affect our comfort zone, the way that we're living, um, the way that we're um, acting as a people who are uh, identified as consumers by by these by the domination system. So all these things are changing more rapidly than we, we might be aware. And some of them are really changing for the better, even though it doesn't feel that way in the short term. But agility with change is to be comfortable with not knowing. It's to be comfortable with the space in between stories. And as leaders offering new narratives to others, we really want to allow our own spiritual practices to help us be comfortable not only with not knowing but also with not doing anything and um, that is kind of subversive and weird especially if you're a very active social change leader um, or if you're very busy all the time as many of us are um, inaction is part of what we're going to be offering in these earth partnership practices just to throw a little bit of that slowing down into the mix. <laughs> um, <clears throat> another benefit is deepened intimacy with other than humans. Um, another is the ability to release the past, to kind of clean up the clutter of the baggage that we're carrying around, um, which will help us, allow us to, to drop down into the grief that's right underneath everything that's happening. And, and in order for us to keep kind of going in the day, we don't really approach that, which, which is natural. It makes sense. But um, one of these earth practices has to do with that. And also a deepened commitment to care at all levels, not just um, the social care, uh, in, in, you know, family care and uh, care about society or policy, but there's a different level of care that the earth will be in conversation with us about. And then joy 
and ecstasy and deep presence. Um, all of this is something that the earth does and that it's a part of who we are naturally. We've already taken a break. We'll go forward. Now, my sense is we have about 20 minutes left. I think that we'll probably enter into a conversation about the first Earth Partnership practice, or, or at least the context behind it. But, but I think that because of um, all the introduction of this kind of contextual background, we'll, we'll probably have to resume our conversation next week about the first two practices. And I think that's important to give us all the space and time we need particularly because these first two cosmological dynamics are um, the very, very basic underpinning of all the rest of them. And um, this is a little bit about this uh, masculine feminine values that um, we're going to start with. And we don't want to go over this quickly. We want to really get a deep sense of this in our bones, in our body, um, to help us with that inner territorial integrity that Donna mentioned. But just kind of for your background reference, very briefly, um, the 10 uh, powers of the universe as presented by Brian Swim in this 2004 DVD series. The first one is about um, focusing, um, concentrating life force. He calls this centration. The second one is just simply gravity and all these electromagnetic and nuclear interactions, the things that hold the planet together hold the cosmos together, and we might call that allurement. The third one is about um, things coming into being that have never been before, things that are new, and we might call this creativity or just emergence. The fourth one is about balance, and a great example of this, of course, is um, the balance of uh, biospheric systems, basic life systems that we see through climate change are out of balance and we're beginning to understand why they're out of balance. We also understand how complex they really are. And um, this uh, scientific word for this is homeostasis, homeostasis. So it's kind of the metabolism of the body, if you will. The fifth one, um, as I mentioned just a minute ago, is about releasing these outmoded ways of being that no longer serve us. And this domination uh, worldview is one of those. But in order for us to release and to let go and to be comfortable with death, we experience change. Um, we experience things that, that just get destroyed, things that have been building up for long periods of time um, degrade and die. This is just the life-death cycle. And but it could be described as cataclysm. We are in that stage of cataclysm right now um, in, the, in this in kind of long-term geological um, eras. We're in a place of species die-off and cataclysm. So we'll be talking a lot more about that. Um, the sixth thing that the universe does um, can be thought of as, as true partnership, as mutually enhancing relationships um, science thinks of it as creating synergy among in ecosystems um, where the features of this are complexity, diversity, and depth. Um, but if we are really entering into um, mutually enhancing relationships, then over time, all the aspects of these lovely ecosystems, these biomes, these habitats, will become multifaceted, will become very diverse, and that diversity will be celebrated. It's, it's a very exciting aspect to talk about is, is synergy. And the seventh thing that the, that the universe does is based on the work of Charles Darwin and natural selection, but it takes it way into a different um, worldview and, and a way of understanding how change happens. And it's about this reshaping that we're, we're asking for. This is a really uh, daring thing to do, is to come and to work with oppositional forces, uh, either on the personal level or cultural level, so that we can actually transmute and change our shape. Um, nobody really wants to do this, but this is part of what's required for humanity to self-constrain our impact on the planet, because we've grown way beyond the limits of any natural ecology as a species. We're way beyond. We've taken way much more power than we know what to do with. And we don't like the idea of limiting ourselves, but this is what this power of the universe addresses. 
the eighth power of the universe is about the transformational aspect of change, seeding new visions. And that's, of course, what Brian's work is all about, the Center for Partnership Studies. And if we're a transformational leader, we are in the business of offering new, new narratives and new visions for how to move forward. And we'll talk more about practices to support this. And the ninth thing that the universe does, it's all about interrelationship and nurturing, and we might just call it care. It's also about compassion um, and how we um, evolve our care and, 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 and express that and make it new in the world and new levels. Interspecies care. And the tenth one is really about love, but specifically at the level of feeling. And, and Brian Swim calls this radiance. And this is where we're going to begin to connect the dots between light and feeling and money and wealth, what makes real wealth. So that is um, kind of in a nutshell, a little bit of that uh, powers of the universe framework. As I said, we'll, we'll be using and utilizing this framework very casually, kind of loosely, so that we can have an open kind of, um, I might say, an open source <laughs> conversation about self design practices. And um, the practices that I'm going to introduce will be very specific, but it will also hopefully inspire you to um, see how to modify those practices to design some of your own. And um, <clears throat> before we close today, I want to just enter into the space of the first um, uh, partnership practice. But, but uh, one of the um, concepts that I want to hold all of these practices is the idea of image. And uh, this is a very powerful little segment of a poem from David White's work in uh, his book, The House of Belonging. And he says, hold to your own truth at the center of the image you were born with. So part of um, the class exercise that I offer to, to prepare is to um, become aware of an image that jumps out at you from the natural world. And I want to just say a little tiny bit right now about my sense of images, and I think some of you will probably will resonate with this, is that we are aware that we're moving culturally into a time when it's kind of exciting, actually, when we're working much more with images and, and video particularly and, and all kinds of images than we were even, you know, three years ago, five years ago, 15 years ago. It's less about the written word and more about images now, particularly in technology and communications. Yet, um, what the domination culture does is, is commodifies these images so that we're not only bombarded with too many images, but it actually will use images to get us to have, for example, consumer behaviors, or it might get us to have a feeling that will make us have a certain limited identity of what it is to be human. Um, part of my work in the world has to do with deep imagery and also with, with what I call deep image literacy. So this is connected to eco-literacy and it's connected to media literacy. But image literacy is a little bit about how we identify and partner with soul images, images that come to us on the level of soul. And again, going into uh, the work of Carl Jung and depth psychology, we could say that um, an experience of synchronicity often does offer an image that where, where we didn't notice it before. Now, it, it could be literally a visual image. It could come to us in any myriad of ways. It could be a sound or a piece of music. It could be a thought or an intuition that we hold deeply in our heart. It could be a word or a phrase from a piece of poetry that we read in the morning in our, in our morning meditation that stays with us all day. But this um, quote by David White, um, hold to your own truth at the center of the image you were born with is a bigger way of talking about this inner territorial integrity of who we are in our truest nature. 
And my um, premise here is that this has to do with our relationship with the natural world, that we can't know um, what our central, quote, image is or our soul, our soul identity. We can't really know that unless we're connected to the earth. We, we can't identify it if we're floating on this kind of abstracted envelope above the earth in this kind of industrial consciousness. In order for us to discover, to kind of uncover the image um, at the center that we were born with, we have to go back into a, a little bit of an indigenous um, journey back into the natural world and, and um, some of the work of um, uh, uh, rites of passage um, work, some of the people that do um, nature-based soul inquiry work are doing this. They're inviting us to go back and to identify, not necessarily conceptually identify, but identify in our body, in our bones, in our intuition, in our heart, in our feeling level, what is the quote image? And, and when I use the word image again, it's this felt sense, it's this feeling for example, um, <clears throat> I can just share with you a little bit about what I'm learning about my own soul's unique image. And that, I think, for me, has to do with radiance. It has to do with this kind of quality of inspiring others and being able to convey um, a deep sense of um, re reverberation and resonance and excitement about who we really are in relationship with the earth. Um, when I did my very first vision quest at age 16, I was in northwestern Nebraska, and I was up in this kind of Pine Ridge ecosystem, which is just lovely. It's kind of this uh, short grass prairie with these kind of dry sandstone cliffs, um, huge open rolling hills, big, huge sky. Um, I grew up in Nebraska, so I really, really love that area. And when I was young, I saw... Um, the quality of light and how the light, particularly the sunset at the end of the day was held in this golden grass that was growing in these open fields, this native prairie grass. And it blew me away. It shattered me. It, 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 it just destroyed my identity. That was not my true self. It filled me with, with uh, ecstasy and light. It filled me with radiance. I understood what the grass and the light was saying to me. I couldn't say it in words, but I knew that's who I was, right? That is part of um, the truth. That's part of my truth at the center of this image that, that I carry forward. And it's really, it sounds almost um, childlike, you know, it sounds almost innocent, but yet um, if we lose who we are at the depth of our soul's image, then we can't go forward as leaders with integrity, especially working with, with um, earth partnerships because we aren't hearing what the earth is saying to us about who we are. So this is a lot of food for thought. It's not like we're going to capture or digest all of this right now, but <clears throat> what I guess I'm inviting us to do is as we move through these learnings, about these practices, we want to begin to be aware of images. We want to begin to um, filter and say no to uh, too many images during the day and influx. For example, if you're somebody that really enjoys social media, and even if you use it for your work, there's nothing wrong with that, but putting limits around how much you're bombarded with ideas and images through social media might be useful during uh, this time of earth partnership practices. Um, if you're a person who watches television, many of you may not, I, I don't, but if you do, again, consider um, constraining the number and, and kind of images that are coming forward. Um, so again, uh, in, the, in the old way, you know, um, before, before modern technology, it was a little, you know, life wasn't exactly easy necessarily, but it probably was a little bit easier to be captured in a single day or maybe in a week or a month by one image, one event, one experience that may happen. Let's say you're out in the field, you know, harvesting your, your vegetables and, and a bird comes and says something to you. <laughs> there's an image and experience there. Maybe you can hold on and, and just work with that one event 
for a long time, a long time. That's, that's the image right there. There are no other images. The bird and the conversation, that's it. But in our modern day, we're asked incessantly to be pulled away from that one image that's presenting itself in that day or that week, that one soul image you're working with. And so for all of us, that's part of the, the practices. Uh, uh, the idea of, of working with images consciously threads through the, all of these practices, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Donna, for that comment that childlike innocence is to be honored and revered. That's right. So any quick questions? We're about five minutes before the hour here when we need to wrap up, but any quick questions? about these, this concept of this deep image literacy that I've just kind of introduced here. Clarifications, confusions, insights. Feel free to unmute and make a comment or put in the chat. I'd like to make a comment. Oh, this is Mario. Um, you know, when you were talking about the social media, you know, I kind of cringed because... Uh, <laughs> Here I am still at the computer, uh, but uh, I have cut out TV, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, we listen to, you know, uh, National Public Radio, and I'm, I'm really conscious of, you know, you were mentioning TV and social media, but when you were saying that, I was thinking of the radio as well, uh, which, you know, bombards us with, as you said, images can be sound as well, concepts, ideas. Uh, we're constantly being bombarded with those, not only visual images. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, it's just great to get away. I mean, like when I was driving up to uh, through Canada, I, I turned the radio off. I had my whole bag of CDs with me, but for some reason I never put them in. You know, I was just like drive there, be with myself. So in a lot of ways, my trip was a, a, a retreat in a sense. Uh, uh, anyway, um, just oh. wanted to share. Mm -hmm. That's lovely, Mario. I, I also, I did a lot of driving this summer myself and I found that I was less drawn to, I often listen to audiobooks when I travel, but I found too that I was less drawn to having any kind of story or anything other than just watching and understanding and enjoying the landscape and just feeling myself driving across these vast spaces. Like that was enough for me, you know, as long as I didn't get too tired, but, um, but thank you for your comments. It, so, you know, like what I'm suggesting, suggesting goes against the grain of the way that society is pushing us. It's the system as it's set up now makes it very difficult to do some of what I'm suggesting. So it's not like I'm saying this is necessarily um, easy or, or just some, some of it might feel almost counterintuitive or like a huge effort. But in fact, what I'm inviting us to do in these practices is to just uh, be with the body sense of that effort, like, you know, <laughs> like if you're someone who actually makes your living through social media, you're just, you're put in a quandary, aren't you? It's like, wow, well, if I, if I consciously want to, you know, decrease my intake of images, <laughs> junk images, <laughs> junk food, whatever. Um, what, but, but yet I have to be on social, you know, so you, so you kind of, it's not that you have to solve that problem. It's that you become aware of the disconnect that's caused between the domination system and technology and communications and, and what we're asking ourselves to do with um, partnership with the earth, because in order for us to hear the voice of the earth, we really do have to slow down and it's really hard to slow down. So we really do have to get out into nature. Well, what if our back is hurting that day and we just can't get to our favorite park? It's just impossible. Or, or what if we, you know, have a bunch of noise coming from a neighbor in the back or, or, you know, or whatever. And we just can't, there's no images that come, there's no birds talking to us that day, nothing happens. And we feel a bit isolated. Well, it might take a little bit tiny more extra effort to make a choice and say, you know, I'm going to drive that extra half an hour to go to such and such a trail where I know I can, I can deeply reconnect and that's going to change everything. So it's these practices are mindful practices, but they also involve getting up off the meditation stool and out the door. And um, it's, it's just a funny, interesting paradox that really that we're offering this learning through the online, uh, you know, 
platform because we can include more people that way. But yet, of course, the most ideal way for us to be offering this learning is under a big, huge oak tree in the middle of a beautiful field when we're all physically together, <laughs> the way that Buddha did it. <laughs> so we can kind of um, think of our learning with that image and knowing that we have that tree right down the street or right out in the park beckoning us to come and uh, begin to metabolize and digest some of the concepts we've introduced today. And um, thank you, Heidi, for this, this comment about this podcast. Um, take a look in the chat, everyone. There's a nice link that I'll include in the follow-up email, an on being podcast. And um, so we're at the top of the hour, and um, it's a good place to, to end for today. Uh, I think it'll be just perfect for us next week to dive right into the first um, uh, Power of the Universe, the first partnership practice. Um, on our preparation email that I'll send a few days, probably next Monday or next Sunday, something like that, I'll, I'll give us a little bit of um, lead in uh, a preparation thought for that. But I would say that between now and then, that to not only digest some of the thoughts that we've offered, but to keep working with images you might even be like um, an anthropologist and keep an image literacy journal. Um, you know, how did I feel today about the images that were coming to me? Did I feel overwhelmed? Was it, was it too much? Was it just right? Um, was there one particular event or thing that came to me today from the natural world that has stayed with me? Um, maybe keep a little journal, just an awareness journal. There's no judgment, no right or wrong. It's just noticing. And like any mindfulness practice, you begin to kind of say, wow, I, I don't want this image anymore in my life. I, I won't let this particular image or story hurt me or uh, change the way I think about the world. I won't let this really violent thing that I just saw on this billboard, <laughs> whatever they, I mean, sometimes, you know, these, these huge announcements that they make very, very large can be really, if you really take in the statement, they can be really frightening. Uh, so Anyway, um, maybe maybe just be working with images. Um, that this kind of work prepares us for the reception of really subtle communications and images coming from nature directly. If that makes sense. So before we close, any final thoughts or comments that we want to share? Don't see any hands up. Yeah, thank you, June. <laughs> thank you, Donna. I'm looking at the chat here. And I do really uh, encourage everyone, if you haven't registered for the next week or the following weeks, if, you, if you're able to join us, please do. As you can see, this learning is entered into in a big way and it builds sequentially upon itself. So um, if you have friends and colleagues that want to join the conversation, this is a perfect time to join as of next week. And, um, you know, my email, I'll send that to you as well. And yeah, June has that question. Okay, for us to invite friends. Yeah, they would need to register directly themselves and pay for each session separately. Um, but yes, I'm really, really encouraging people to come and hear this material and learn. Um, as I said, everything is recorded, so it'll all be available to you. And additionally, there's about a a 30 or 40 page kind of uh, earth practices handbook that towards the end of our series in October, I'll be distributing to everyone. Any other quick thoughts? Thank you everyone for coming today. I feel very, very blessed to have you in our circle. And I'm really, really excited about our learning process going forward. This is very grounding for me as well and opens up new vistas of, of learning in this group conversation. It's very exciting. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful Wednesday, and get out there into nature. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Take care. So the little red button on your control panel at the upper left is the way to sign off.